I refuse to believe that Pepe the Frog 89 is lying to me for no reason. I'm Eddie Webb. And I'm Chris dragged in to watch this show, Spivey. <laughs> Today, we're going to watch Peacemaker here on Journalists. Hello and welcome to another episode of Genreless. Before we dive in real quick, um, uh, uh, this is definitely a show uh, where we put a lot of content warnings in front of it. Um, this is in some ways a really uh, hard show to watch. Um, so definitely it, 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 it tackles a lot of isms pretty directly. Um, and it is definitely a uh, R-rated show, perhaps even higher. Uh, so um, if that's not your cup of tea, if you're not here for that, Feel free to skip this. We'll catch you in a couple of weeks because we have another one that comes shortly after this. But um, I just want to make sure you're going in that that this, this Peacemaker is, is a fun show, but it's a very specific kind of fun show. Well, we're just going to do Teen Titans Go next. I don't know why you're warning people after, after about that. <laughs> I mean, Teen Titans though, needs a warning for being so addictive. <sighs> <laughs> I will uh, repeat before this, I had never seen this show. I actively avoided it because Peacemaker was my least favorite part of the Suicide Squad. And I liked the Suicide Squad. Not yes. Suicide Squad, but the Suicide Squad. Right. Um, uh, for those who don't know, um, uh, Peacemaker spun out of the James Gunn Suicide Squad movie, which is, as Chris points out, the Suicide Squad, not just Suicide Squad, um, which was a reboot of the suicide squad movie um although maybe kind of also in canon dc is weird uh but this is not only a spinoff of it but a direct sequel to that movie um it comes right after the heels of that uh and it has some of the same characters and those actors re-portray those characters it is also this and the suicide squad are the main reason why james gunn is now heavily involved in the creative end of the dc uh cinematic efforts as it were um, so this is in a lot of ways, uh, an important show as we track through all the different pieces of it. This is another element of DC post Arrowverse trying to find their, their footing, if you will. Would you call the Suicide Squad, in fact, a requel? A, a, a requel? A requel. What is a requel? A soft reboot, but it's actually a sequel. Requel. Oh, Oh, so like Trademark the new Doctor Who. Trademark in existence. <laughs> Seeming like Eccleston's Doctor Who, where it's like it's both a reboot and a sequel to the original show. Correct. Nice. That, that's a good word. Um, yes, I think it is. Because if I remember correctly, Amanda Waller's played by the same actor in both, right? Yes, she is. Okay. And in so, the TV yeah. show. Yeah. Uh, so and then, yeah. So, so, is, so I, I, guess, I think it's probably cool. So is Flag... And some other characters, and they sort of vaguely reference other things that happened. And we all know that Harley's played by the same actress, who I think, fortunately, at the time of recording, is not going to be Sue Storm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, they they confirmed that it's not going to be her. No, at time of recording, specifically, uh, okay. it's not going to be her. But who knows until it's officially announced? And even then, who knows until it's actually aired in your movie theater? Who's going to be who? Right. Marvel is is. <clears throat> Much like pro wrestling, you never trust anything that comes out of Marvel because it's all swerve, baby. Not even just Marvel, just movie to journal. Like if you watch Zack Snyder's, what was that, Heist of the Dead, how they edited out an actor and put uh, Tig Notaro in his place because he was incredibly problematic. Oh. So until oh, right, viewed, yes. Until viewed, it was a totally different person. So literally until you're watching it in the theater. And even then, only in the theater, because once it goes into a streaming service, they can go back and edit it, much how they did for Captain America and the Winter Soldier and some other shows on Marvel. They got called out, and then they went, oh, we're sorry, we'll fix that. Yeah. Or in positive ways, um, how uh, the Umbrella Academy went back and uh, corrected uh, Elliot Page's credit. Mm -hmm. And I correct myself, saying that even in theaters they can go back and do it because the amazing across the spider-verse oh had yeah some sound issues and they went in and they fixed the sound issues and having seen it again with the correct sound issues makes an amazing movie even more amazing 
I'm glad I waited then because now I, I, I will not have to have watch the bad sound issue version. Oh, and if you haven't seen it, go see Across the Spider-Verse and give them all your money and give them all the shout outs. I, I have heard nothing but great things about Spider-Punk. Well, you've talked a lot to me and that's all I've kind of ranted about for a while now. That's true too. But aside from you, I've also separately heard other people talk nothing but great things about Spider-Punk. So it really just seems like a movie that basically made for me to watch. So I'm looking forward to it. But we're not uh, here to talk about that. What, what are we here to really focus on today? So we're here. Uh, so James Gunn has this tendency of taking obscure comic book characters and doing something interesting with them. Uh, arguably, um, Guardians of the Galaxy was very much an effort towards that. Um, very few people knew any of the characters in Guardians of the Galaxy prior to uh, those movies, and now they're very much beloved. Um, Suicide Squad and then Peacemaker are, well, beloved wouldn't be a strong word, but certainly in the same vein of he is digging deep into DC history to the point where I had to do research on this because I didn't know anything about Peacemaker prior to watching the movie and the show. And I was surprised at how old of a character Peacemaker is. How he sort of jumped multiple comic book companies. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so he was I, I knew about Peacemaker because I, I fall into many rabbit holes. And once again, I will give a shout out to a podcast called Geek History Lessons by Jason Ashley. I listen to it weekly and they had, I think their episode 390 something was about Peacemaker. Oh, wow. Okay. So you may be able to help me with some of the stuff then. Uh, but um, uh, I don't, I think we've talked a little bit about how uh, Charleston Comics was acquired by DC um, because that's what ultimately led to uh, Watchmen in an indirect way. Uh, but uh, he was actually a Charleston character that was created in the 60s as a backup strip. Uh, and then um, he was acquired as part of the DC acquisition. Um, uh, he had a brief kind of pre-crisis of Infinite Earth run. Uh, then he was rebooted like many characters post-Infinite uh, Crisis. Kind of disappeared for a long time. Had a couple of very short uh solo series um and then was just kind of one of those characters that really hardcore dc geeks would when they became writers would kind of reference and put in the background or as a one-on character as a way to kind of show how much they knew about the character uh but he's surprisingly not changed all that much since the 60s <laughs> um he his character concept is much like you see in the TV show, is someone who believes himself to be a pacifist and is so committed to peace that he's willing to use force to advance the cause of peace. Oh, come on. If you're going to do it, you got to say his line. <laughs> you can't do that. You got to say it. Uh, no, you, you say it for me. I don't know what line you're referring to. <laughs> uh, I, I, it's basically, I believe so. I believe so wholeheartedly in peace. I'm willing to kill any man, woman, or child to make it happen. <laughs> Right, right. You, you gotta it. like commit to Peacemaker. Right. Well, well, that's that's the interesting part is that um, uh, initially he was presented th this this obvious dichotomy was relatively straightforward. Like he's actually uh, a diplomat, and um, he genuinely had no problem with this very obvious contradiction in terms. Uh, then after the crisis, uh, he starts to to. They start to play with that. Like, um, originally, uh, this was a mental illness issue that came from his time in Nazi death camps. Uh, or, more his father was a Nazi death camp attendant. So, if based on my remembering of Geek History Lessons, sorry to, to jump in. No, no, feel free. I'm going by what His I father here. was not not even attendant, was like the head of a of a Nazi death camp and killed tens of thousands of, of Jewish people. Wow. And so... That psychological trauma was then imparted on the peacemaker, and it went to the point where they had he was seeing like ghostly visions of his father pushing him to do to become a Nazi. It's kind of oh jeez, oh jeez. It is a dark, messed up load of shit. Like the entire backstory and history of it. Uh, right. Originally, I think the character was also supposed to be basically the comedian from Watchmen. Yes, so you can easily see those parallels. Like, mm. yeah, and DC sort of rebooted it and made it more sanitized question mark right um uh but i mean ultimately peace 
Maker is kind of DC's, well, he's one of two DC versions of Punisher. The other ones amusingly being Vigilante, uh, which also appears in the show. So all of the DC kind of variants on the Punisher end up in the same show, because that makes sense. Um, what whereas, about Mad Dog? Okay, sorry, there are three. You're right, Mad Dog does not appear in this show. Um, but he's but you're from right, the Because there, there's, there's Peacemaker, which predates uh, the Punisher. Then there's Vigilante, which was very much the 80s version of the pop, the Punisher being popular to a version of that. The Mad Dog was the parody of the 90s version of the Punisher. Um, <laughs> so, so you're right, there's kind of an arc of, of DC Punisher pastiches throughout history. That's a sentence I never thought I'd have to say ever again. But <laughs> Sorry for the siren in the background. Perfect timing. Yes, uh, as, as Peacemaker has gone off to enforce peace somewhere else in London. So Eddie, don't let Eddie deceive you. Eddie, in fact, has a siren little buzzer that he's pushing every so often. <laughs> he's like, ooh. <laughs> Behind the scenes magic. <laughs> um, uh, but anyway, so uh, Peacemaker... Uh, like Rick Chris said, was influenced in the comedian. He's popped up in some other places, uh, Kingdom Come. Uh, he had a passing reference in uh, Earth 52. Um, he did have a walk on a part in Vigilante. But again, very minor character, not a huge amount of reach. Uh, so everything I've read is that no one was like, oh, Peacemaker is the character, not only couldn't even lead a comic book, let alone a, a popular, expensive streaming show. So I, as I understand it, a lot of this came about because uh, ultimately John Cena had a blast on the Suicide Squad and actually pitched the idea to James Gunn. And James Gunn said, sure, let's see if DC goes for it. And DC said, sure, let's go for it. Um, Titans isn't doing great for us. Uh, so let's, let's figure something else out. And uh, so John, John Cena is actually one of the uh, co-executive producers on the show. Uh, and I... I, I John Cena is a whole kettle of fish as a wrestling fan, an old school wrestling fan. At that, um, I have lots of opinions about John Cena, uh, most of which are positive, despite most wrestling fans. Um, I actually met John Cena way before his wrestling career really started. Uh, uh, he did a charity show in Cincinnati in like 2002 ish. Uh, and I met him backstage very, very briefly. Um, very nice guy. Uh, so I, I've, I've known of him for quite a while and a small part of me has always been like excited to see when he does well in his career. And so I, I watched this show primarily because like, Oh, it's John Cena. The show might be terrible, but I'll watch it because John Cena's in it. And I was very surprised by the show I watched. The only thing I know John Cena from is John Cena being a, a bad actor to becoming, I would say a good actor now having seen Peacemaker. Yeah. His bad acting was when he first started in that, um, Amy Schumer, Bill Hader comedy mm -hmm. to now. Because the only wrestling points I have is Glow, the original original show from like the 80s, and the very cool Netflix series that ended way too soon. Yes. Oh, God, yes. The, the Netflix Glow show is fantastic. We should do a, a, a short run of like wrestling dramas. So three or four off the top of my head I could think of we could talk about. And then people um, just hear me say, what move is that? Really? Right. That can't work. Right. That, that's implausible. Um, uh, but, uh, I'll probably drop some John Cena facts throughout because John Cena is an intensely interesting individual. Uh, but anyway, uh, is there anything about the Peacemaker comic book version? Cause you know more about it than I do, uh, uh, that we should know about going into this. Um, just to repeat, Peacemaker is a bag of dicks and the fact he wears a toilet on his head should be a good representation of the character. He belongs in one. Yeah. And that's actually a good point is, um, he he. When we say he's a, 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 a homage to the or Punisher on some levels, not is not meant in any way, shape, or form to be a sympathetic character. Most characters in DC Universe don't like him, uh, and this show he was definitely one of the villains in the Suicide Squad, and this show does not present him any better. At least to start, there is an actual character arc for Peacemaker, but he is a piece of shit. And we're going in, this, we're following, the main character is, in fact, a horrible human being. Yeah. I am okay. no, nothing else for Peacemaker, but I personally love, like, 90% of all the work that James Gunn does, just hands mm -hmm. down. Like, his early stuff all the way up to now and with this. And so that was the only reason that I really said, okay, I will give Peacemaker a shot 
when you suggested it. Otherwise, I'd have been like, no, no Peacemaker. And I am happy that we did the show. I found myself and I enjoyed it more than I thought I would. And now I have one more show to fucking watch because of Eddie <laughs> Webb. Because I'm watching the Umbrella Academy when I can. And now I got to fucking go back and really watch all of Peacemaker. Uh, actually, before we start the show, talking about the show proper, I need to talk about the intro. Uh, and I don't usually do this, but the intro to the show is not the 15 second intros we have with tv nowadays it is a full like minute and a half two minute song intro to the show and james gunn designed it because he said too many people skip over the intro in tv shows he wanted to create an intro that people could not skip past they had to watch it because they're obsessed with it did you like the intro to this show i started it the first time i watched it i of course watched it i was like what the fuck is this why, why is that the dance <laughs> Who's that? Um, by the second episode, I enjoyed it and I found myself watching it more out of enjoyment than quiz than being inquisitive about it. So yes, good job. But it goes back to I think a point we've made consistently throughout the show is that any character can be interesting if it's written well. It always goes back to the writing. So you pay your writers more more than what they're worth. And we may be in the writer strike sometime, either when we're recording this, possibly before, maybe after, but it needs to end and you need to pay them. And AI needs to not be writing scripts. That should be jobs oh, for guess. writers. Not Absolutely. that we're both writers and we may <laughs> care about this a lot. No, I have I have strong, <laughs> complicated feelings about uh, AI, but certainly, yes, uh, um, uh, we, we stand in solidarity of the Writers, writers Guild of America, 100%. And uh, James Gillen has a talent for writing and in addition to being a, a great director, business, business person. I don't know yet. I have to wait and see. I will say, say this and then we can move on because we should get on point that I want James Gunn to write a Mr. Terrific TV series. Yes. With a real budget and incorporate the rest of the DC universe. Yes. Like even if it's the terrifics like that he had, which was a, DC riff of the Fantastic Four with Mr. Terrific, Plastic Man, and two other characters that elude me at the moment. That actually sounds really fun. I should dig it up at some point. Okay. Um, uh, but yeah, James Gunn, uh, I believe, wrote every episode on this. He did not direct every episode, but he he wrote every episode on this. Um, so. Uh, uh, anyway. uh, our, our, our one more piece for James Gunn. I gave James Gunn a lot of, a lot of love, uh, a negative. He puts his, I think she's his wife in everything. I, I'm not a fan of that. Like at some point in time, you got to separate your friends and everything from some of the work. Said it. Done. This uh, from the man who uh, we, we, we watched um, Fire Walk with me and talked about how all the same actors keep showing up in, in all of those movies. But there's a difference. Lynch is not as doesn't have as much work in the world as James Gunn does. And the work he has is spread out over vast chunks of decades. And unfortunately, a lot of those people have passed away. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. So episode one, a whole new world. Five months after his mission with the suicide squad in Corto Maltese, Christopher Smith slash peacemaker has recovered from the injuries he suffered there and is discharged from the hospital. Upon returning to his trailer home, Smith is confronted by a group of Argus agents, Clemson Mern, Emilia Harcourt, John Economos, and newcomer Leota Abadayo. Abadayo. Uh, Mern gives him the choice of returning to the Belle Reve prison or joining a new mission dubbed Project Butterfly. Smith reluctantly accepts the latter. Smith visits his father, Augie, who retrieves his pet bald eagle eagerly and acquires a new outfit. He then has dinner with the team, and Mern gives him a dossier of the assassination target. Smith later attempts to flirt with Harcourt in a bar, but is rejected and instead goes home with a different woman at the bar, Annie Stuffens Sturfensen. Sturfhausen. Adebayo privately discusses her role with Project Butterfly with her mother, Argus leader Amanda Waller. Sturfhausen attacks Smith and reveals she has superhuman strength. In the ensuing fight, Smith activates a sonic boom weapon in his helmet that destroys her. That summary does not do justice to this episode. But there's a lot happening here, so I really need to condense it down. <laughs> I Where do we, I don't I don't we're, we'll start it. We can come back to the top, but I want to start with if you have a dog, would you name it Doggy? 
If you have a daughter, would you name her Daughtery? All right, we can go. We can go on that. <laughs> um, I did look this up because I was curious. Eagly is a character that is unique to this show. Eagly is not originally a comic book character, which actually made me a little <laughs> sad because I absolutely believed he would have been a Silver Age character. <laughs> Um, uh, I guess a point for the comics. It is, I just want to point out that they're using the original Peacemaker and not one of the different iterations of Peacemaker that came after. Cause I want to say there were a couple of other people that were also Peacemaker. Okay. Christopher Smith uh, is the original one. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, so I guess like earlier, basically we get a previously on with the Suicide Squad. So it, this follows directly after the Suicide Squad movie. And if you, for some reason, haven't watched that movie, it gives you all the information you need for that. Although, I will argue, uh, if you're interested in actually watching this all the way through, it is worth going to watch this Suicide Squad movie, partially because it's a great movie, but also because seeing uh, the the turn against Flag in that movie helps get a little more context for this whole show. Um, so this is definitely a direct follow on that. Um, but him being discharged from the hospital, that scene really sets the whole tone for this show, which is that <laughs> A, it's going to be irreverent. B, it's going to be violent, and C, it is not going to shy away from some really hard problems at the core of superhero narratives, which was not something I expected on this show in any way, shape, or form. But the the janitor directly points out, oh, you're the racist superhero. (laughs) (laughs) And that trend does not go away (laughs) from this show. I I want to give that janitor props because that was pitch perfect like yes that person's acting odds on, on point i loved it you can't trust me oh <laughs> it's like come on let me tell you something you can't do ah oh, beautiful yes um uh, i will say that uh i actually listened to the uh podcast of peacemaker as it was coming out so there's a, 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 a companion podcast for each episode and one of the things i learned from this is that um Several scenes, and this one is included, John Cena did a lot of ad-libbing, um, and uh, the actor who played the uh, janitor also was doing some ad-libbing. So chunks of that scene were just purely ad-libbing, riffing between John Cena and this other actor. Uh, so um, that kind of energy, I think, really helps. And I know John James Gunn is very supportive of actors ad-libbing, and so when, when, when those scenes really hit, uh, um, he's happy to adjust his scripts to whatever the actors are feeling, and this scene again, even from a production standpoint, sets a tone of like it's not going to be polished in the sense of like a MCU thing where everything kind of connects feelings. It's going to be a little messy in a lot of different ways, but that's not necessarily bad or something to be avoided. And this show had a gritty feel to it that the previous one that Titans wanted to act like it had, and it yes. did it without uh over the top sexy sexiness or just profanity for the sake of profanity it was on point and when we when i say i want a gritty superhero show i want something like this or maybe just a a tad darker even right but it did it effortlessly it wasn't like all right oh fuck you fuck you fuck batman it was no it was constantly reinforced and it was using just people's language and dialogue to reinforce that to them and then this the actions the character took takes reinforces that also that is good writing that is what i love to see right um uh, i'm gonna ma- mention this just to make sure i remember to talk about it but like the, you we talked last time about how uh, titans never really addressed the here are the problems with batman as a concept that they set up for whereas episode four of this show directly has that conversation literally has that conversation um so you're right this is uh, very much the show I think Titans wants to be on some level, with the exception of, yes, it's funnier because that's what James Gunn does, and he hired a lot of very funny people to work on it. Uh, but it, it's so confident in its betrayal of adult because it's genuinely adult. It's like, I'm, we're telling a story in an adult way, but we're also tackling adult themes. Uh, it's not just uh, uh, a 13-year-old's perception of what's edgy and adult. It's, it's actually an adult show. Mm-hmm. And to John Cena's credit, seeing the realization that he was free to leave the hospital, but not really sure what he should do because he knew he has more of a prison sentence left. It's like, are you sure I could go? Yep. And then like running the car and that joy of relief was, ah, I, I, I like that too. 
Yes. Um, one of the things that I think wrestlers have an advantage of when they're able to make the transition is they have no fear of looking foolish in order to make a scene really work. Um, and it's little things like um, him that that last shot of him in the hospital where you can see see his butt crack. You can see like you know he's naked under that thing, and the fact that he's acting in that extremely awkward outfit and just selling it scene as hard as he can. I think some of that comes from his experience in pro wrestling because you do a lot of embarrassing stuff to try to get a, a match over. Uh, so, so you're um, he, saying that these wrestling matches aren't real. <laughs> <laughs> that it's what? almost scripted. Uh, uh, Chris, and then we're going to have a conversation about that. <laughs> <laughs> Santa Claus isn't real either. Okay. So no, uh, after what? this, uh, he then goes who home. Who is that order. man in the red suit that keeps showing up in my home? He's a communist. Oh, <laughs> have some good ideas from the old days. Um, uh, so yeah, so we're, um, so he goes to his trailer, um, and again, I mean, this show is relentlessly showing that Peacemaker is, he's not a hero, even though he's positioned himself as one. Uh, and we, the janitor called him out on his genuine, his alleged uh, heroic nature. And now even the, the, his circumstances are pointing out. It's like, he's, you know, uh, his, he's, he's living out of a trailer. Um, he had to break into his own trailer to get his stuff. Uh, he's, kind of on the run he's not sure uh uh it's it's it, it's it's a, it's it's a nice balance because it presents him as a person who that he's down on his luck so that makes him a little sympathetic to him but also there's a lot of you kind of put yourself in his circumstance you know he was in jail for four years and that's something else that comes up in this episode a lot uh then we meet the argos agents uh some of which were in the original movie uh and um we, I mean, we, 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 the ones we're really introduced to is uh, Laoda. Uh, that's the only character that we actually get any kind of introduction to at this point. Um, we see her with her wife. Uh, they're a very sweet couple. Um, and there's some kind of, clearly she's keeping something from her wife because she's trying to have this job as being, you know, very kind of just about paperwork and administrative stuff. But clearly she's a secret agent, effectively. Um, so I already get a sense that. Uh, Adebayo is more than what she's saying, but we never, it's never pushed into, we should, she's, she's nefarious. It, it's, we're always cheering for Leota. We, we, no point does the show ever take it off that we, we, we want to love this character. She is the character that you want to, she's, she's the only decent character in this whole show uh, <laughs> as a person. And uh, it's it's really amazing how Gunn manages to, how kind of should Gunn and the actor manage to find that balance and really just hold hard to it the entire run of the show. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, 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 I cannot expound upon that more because it is very well done. Right. Uh, so, uh, Mern, um, gives the choice. Uh, and again, it, it's, it's a quiet chance to kind of recap a little bit of what happened in the suicide squad. Um, it's the, by the way, you were in prison. Blah, blah. Um, and so that happens. It's, it's a straightforward scene, uh, but then he goes to visit his father, and this scene is uncomfortable in very good ways. Uh, it's uncomfortable because the show never lets you forget that Augie is a white supremacist piece of shit. He is a horrible father. Every step of the way, you're never at any point in time. Be, oh, maybe. No, if, if you even start to think maybe I should feel good about this guy, there's smoke action that goes, no, he's a Nazi. <laughs> Stop thinking that. Are you, what, what are you? Um, and, and, and again, John Cena does a great job of trying to find that balance of like, I know my father's a jerk and we have problems, but I want to love him because he's my father. And so the, the, the sheer awkwardness in his body language and how he looks, he looks like he's a little kid next to this guy where he, John and Cena clearly could <laughs> snap this man over his knee easily, but he looks like he's terrified of this old man. And it's just almost heartbreaking to see how he's been abused by this man. As well, he should be because this is the T-1000, the, the yes. pinnacle of technology. Oh, you and, the, the Terminator series have gone so far downhill. He's he's he threw Arnold around like Arnold was nothing. 
So we know that he can take wrestlers head heads down. Right, right, absolutely. Uh, before we really go into the father, can we take a minute though to talk about the neighbor who is established yes. right here? Yes, when he shows point. up. That is throwing out just a, a few little, little, th- little some vibes, and it's nice to see. And he's trying to you see Cena quickly trying to run to the house, and that tells you a story right there. You're not sure which way it's going to go yet, but. That shows it must have been some sort of previous history between the two. Right. Um, and it does a really good job of something that, again, uh, the show does overall, but this episode in particular is that nobody, nobody gives Smith an inch. Every time Smith says something horrible, someone on this show calls him out on it immediately and smacks him down. Uh, and it's... I mean, look, well, the exception of his father, uh, his father goes the opposite route, but then Smith is put into the role of trying to moderate his father's views, right? So any point in time, a character is presented with a horrible viewpoint, at no point does the show ever let you forget that this is a viewpoint that we should find objectionable. Uh, and it starts, right, I'm going to start here, but it continues here because like we had it with the janitor, we had it with the Argus agents, now we have it again with the neighbor because the neighbor is like, Basically calls him a supervillain. It straight up just says, you're, you're a supervillain, you're not a superhero. And this gets Smith angry. Uh, but again, it's – you can almost see the self-loathing on Cena's face when he's doing this. Uh, uh, he does a really good job of that kind of like – I don't know what to say. My, you know, my words are stumbling over each other. But also that body language of like you're also kind of right. Uh, it's, it's – there's a lot going on in this scene, but it's also really, really funny. Yeah, and this show did something I did not give it credit for, even when I was enjoying it up to this point. The nuance of seeing generational hatred and how people are impacted by their parents, it teaches them to hate. And how even Mm -hmm. if you want to or don't want to, it still impacts and becomes a part of you. And seeing the, the nuance between the old school hatred inisms compared to like the new school hatred isms and trying to balance those two and show how different they are, but yet how they're both an atrocious thing to have. Like, right. Kudos and to like, James Gunn and the writers. Yeah. Uh, um, like that scene where Smith's trying to, to, to bond with his dad and he's talking about uh, uh, the two people he worked with, and basically how, the, how it was funny that this guy had got chewed on by rats as a child. And they're, they're laughing about it. And then his father almost has a, you know, it's, it's like he's coughing and he's about to have a medical condition. And then as soon as Smith shows a little bit of, of sympathy for his father, his father immediately challenges him and doubles down the hate. And it's like, we're joking about someone who was traumatized as a child and now we've made it worse somehow. So it's like, it's both funny and just deeply, deeply uncomfortable the entire scene. And there's great pauses in it that adds to that discomfort, just long lingering, not Lynchian length, certainly, but uh, uh, a slightly <laughs> longer than you would expect to kind of just let that silence sink in when someone says something awkward and everyone's kind of is quiet for a second. It's really good direction. And he takes him for a new helmet. This yes. closet. The closet. <laughs> oh. Oh, it's like a mini TARDIS. I, it is. And I love the I love fact it. that it's, in this episode at least, it's just presented as a fact. Right? There, There's no... It just, it pushes, it does a sequence, it goes through a door, and of course there's just a trans-dimensional closet here with super science stuff. Doesn't everyone have this? Because it's the DC universe, Right? <laughs> There's no apology, no explanation. It's just there's something that exists, and everyone treats it like it's a perfectly normal thing in the midst of all this extremely mundane uh, setting. And that's why it works so well. Is it's not they don't apologize for it. They just mm-hmm. lean into it. You are in the DC universe. If someone's come here, they're expecting some level of this, and you don't have to give them hold their hands. You just make it happen. And if you tell a good story with it, they're on board. And then it makes you question, who the hell is this racist father? Like, why are they living in this place if they have all that stuff? And then, so then you also get the fact that Peacemaker is not able to build a helmet to these using that have all these special little abilities to it, which then goes more into their weirdly destructive relationship that they have to do with each other. 
Mm -hmm. And one thing that I noticed on a rewatch uh, is, um, spoiler for an episode we're going to cover in about 10 minutes now, uh, but um, his father is the White Dragon. Again, really obscure DC character who also is very much as presented. He was a white supremacist asshole in the comics too. Not that much different. Um, and so we see the White Dragon armor and there's actually a shot and it lingers on it and you know mm -hmm. peacemaker stares at it for a moment it's very clearly important but we're given no context for it at all the character knows the context is but we as the audience don't later on it's explained but it's a great way to show back like from day one we knew both who his father was we were told who his father was and also what was ultimately going to happen between the two of them but it was not it was said through omission Right. If, if you, you won't catch it the first time around, you catch it the second time around. And it's, it's again, a great little bit of work of James Gunn being just so confident of like, you don't need to know what this is. All I know is that this is an old guy who's a horrible person and makes super science stuff. That's all you need to know at the moment. And you get just that amount. But then down the road, it's like, oh, there's other stuff here that I didn't catch the first time. And each helmet, it's this felt like the most Bond Q scene I've seen yes. in a long time. So for this mission, James, I've provided you this, and it does this one thing, and that's all it does. Right, and you get to choose sort of which one you want. And it's so it, it it's it's this perfect balance of incredible super science and extremely implausible, because you have to carry an entire different helmet to get X ray vision, right? And it's like, you know, that's useful, but also you have to have. Later on, Luda carries a duffel bag full of helmets because it's so awkward <laughs> to try to change helmets. You're you're forgetting to point out one very important fact. 99% of the helmets all look identical. Yes, that's How true. do you know what it does? Right. They're but, in a but, duffel bag. But Augie uh, knows. That one, that one, that one, that one. He built it, but spoiler but when they're all in a duffel bag how do you know which one you're playing oh out? yeah no you're, you're just grabbing a random one I, and then and i believe that is a gag in one of the episodes we skipped over uh, of him grabbing the wrong helmet so yeah it's it's he is both an impressive character and an extremely dumb character and the show is not afraid to show both those sides <laughs> and then eagerly then he reunites with eagerly who is maybe the best character on the show? It is. Um, it is the. It is uh, hugged by an eagle. Hugged by an eagle, which becomes a running joke. Like that's not just a one-off thing. That becomes a running gag for a while on this show. And I've seen a lot of different things that have pets that are like right there with the character doing things. Never seen a thing that has an eagle. I give you, Lady Hawk. But, you know, that's a totally different sort of thing. Right. Maybe. We don't know what Peacemaker does. Um, <laughs> but that was such a nice touch, and I, I loved it. That is pure over-the-top Americana right there. It is issued to the car. Ah! Oh! Yes. Yes. And, and you're right. That, the thing is, like, this is a character who is obsessed with an iconography of America while missing the entire point of America, which yep. is so perfect. Um, and then to then make Eagly an interesting, not interesting character, but a, a funny character on his own. Um, like, again, if you watch the introduction, there's a great little, e Eagly sweeps down at the very end, he lands. And if you notice, he looks down and adjusts his feet like Eagly missed the mark on the floor during the routine. <laughs> Eagly is CGI. He is not a real bird. But they took the effort to have the CGI character miss its mark on the floor, Chris. <laughs> It was just so well done. Ah. <laughs> and you also get the fact that it loves Peacemaker. It's probably the one being in existence that loves Peacemaker and is unbelievably loyal throughout the entire three episodes that we watched. Yep. Yes. Yes. Um, and I think that helps us to warm up to Peacemaker. It's like there's one thing in the world that loves him. Uh, and we kind of like Eagly. We're kind of an Eagly side. So it's like, okay, well, then maybe, I can, maybe if Eagly can see something in. Christopher Smith, maybe I can see some of Christopher Smith. And that's what the show is inviting you to do. It's like, this is a horrible human being, but we're going to show you why he's here, how, where he came from, and watch his arc. Um, and he's not going to be great at it. He's going to suck at it a lot, but he's at least trying. And that's really what this show is about, is, is he's trying. Uh, so then we go to dinner. 
Um, and it starts with every awkward business dinner I've had in my life mm. where it's like, oh, that guy's showing up. Oh, we have to pretend to like this guy and we have to all eat. Um, and he shows up in costume, um, <laughs> which again, they immediately call him out on. And his reason is just, oh, I'm stretching it out because it's a new outfit, which is the lamest reason ever. <laughs> but, well, it is lame, but at the same time, it's true. Right, right. It, it's not wrong, but it is lame. <laughs> which, uh. which is Peacemaker in a nutshell, right? It's like, it's the he says things that are kind of true, but also if you take a half second thing about it, it make no sense. <laughs> and the digression... Of the word and meaning behind sweet cheeks. Like yes. we, we, we take an extended amount of time on that and everyone then calls him out on it too. Like that is such a, I'm tired of, I'm, I'm giving the show a lot of compliments, yeah. uh, a great way to present that person. And then the constant calling out on it helps us recenter to know that it's bad behavior. So if you were, um, a bag of dicks yourself and you think that peacemaker and his dad are great people, you get reinforced that no, you're wrong. Yep. Yeah. Um, and uh, just it, the we we see uh, the bus boy, um, uh, who we find out later is Gabriel Chase, the vigilante, but we don't know that yet. Um, we just see this guy who seems weirdly obsessed with with Peacemaker, um, which again is the maybe it's another character that likes Peacemaker, but we, see, we realize pretty quickly no, he's also not great uh, because he tries to cover up his social awkwardness by pretending to have a girlfriend who's have and who's excited about having an abortion because he's just doubling down on this extremely uncomfortable and horrible premise. Ooh. And his coworkers clearly don't like him either. So it's like, okay, this guy's not great either. He's got a secret. Um, I'm, for, I'm spending a lot of time in this first episode, but so much gets set up here that I think we're just going to repeat in later episodes. <laughs> are, are we going to talk about the biggest, most uncomfortable thing in the room? Uh, there's so much, Chris. You can have to narrow it down for me. Peacemaker's enormous dick that is so big that it is uncomfortable for people. We he tells us about it. He tells it to the new agent in the parking <laughs> lot who you just met, your coworker you you talked to, known for like an hour, and you tell him about your junk. I cannot confirm this, and I don't think I want to confirm this in any way, shape, or form as meaningful. Uh, but I'm led to understand that that was a riff that John Cena did at the time, and then he asked people to uh, stuff his trunks <sighs> to make it even more obvious of a gag later. <laughs> and even in the humor of that scene and the obnoxious of it with that, you get a reinforcement about how bad Peacemaker is because he asked her about her husband after he saw the ring. It wasn't like your partner, your spouse. It was automatically like, these are my values, so they must be your values. So th even that is undercutting the humor all at once. Right, right. And um, the relationship between Smith and Adebayo is fascinating because in a lot of other shows, Adebayo would have naturally been positioned as just the direct opposite. She, she's a black woman. She's a queer black woman. Um, is basically absolutely everything against what Smith sensibly stands for. But she tries to find the connection there. She 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 blows it off. She she tries to to make it to, to be a decent person, and it's both an indication of Adebayo's character and also a subtle indictment of the role that black women are forced to play in society as being the peacemakers and the the people who have to acquiesce first when in awkward situations. Mm hmm. And. Do, do I need to point out that you literally used the word peacemaker? Yeah. When you yeah, described how to buy you. Oh okay. yeah. 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 No, that was, that was, that was intentional irony there. <laughs> and well, I'm making sure the people in the back. I appreciate, I appreciate you there. make sure everyone gets that joke. Thank you. Cause nothing so says better it, for a joke than explaining it. <laughs> come on. If I explain it two more times, it becomes funny again. Um, <laughs> so I, I love the interaction between Autobio and peacemaker, but at the same time, it shows that this is another nuanced complexity is that a lot of racists have are managed to find something they like and have their one special friend. Yep. 
So they can then later say, I'm not racist. I know so-and-so. Right. And it's, that is another nuanced conversation that is just layered into this, that if it's not something that you're aware of, it just sort of goes right past you. And that is why I'm harping on how good the writing is and how layered it is. Mm -hmm. Like these are relationships that I've seen that I've had to interact with and they're being done on screen in a superhero show with a character that I despise that did not want to watch. Yeah. And it is winning me over. Yeah. Like we, I spent a lot of time talking about things I don't like in some shows and we undercut them with other good parts about it and like changes we would make. I want to spend an equal amount of time after seeing something that has wowed me to this extent. Absolutely. Uh, and, and again, like the show after that scene, we have another scene just like that where we go to Harcourt, she's in the bar and it's a great moment to show. One thing that's actually happening is that each character, with the exception of Mern, is getting kind of a moment on the show to show what they're good at. Right. Um, and uh, this is Harcourt's moment of like, she's, she is sexualized by the people on the show, but she's not sexualized by the show, which is an interesting nuance. Um, her outfits are not provocative in any way. She is not shot in a way that's sexy or provocative, but everyone around her objectifies her and she directly addresses that objectification both to the uh, uh, people that she beats the crap out of and then also Smith, who immediately does a different form of objectification right after that. And the kind of her silly saying, I just want to have a drink and no one will let me do it because I have to deal with your bullshit is so dead on. It's another, we've moved from racism to sexism, but it's the exact same conversation. Mm -hmm. And it is done well each time. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really curious about the composition of the writer's room. I, mm -hmm. I, I want to know like that. I want to know the sensitivity readers they use to all they use to help shape and script and make this happen. Like, right. Unbelievably curious. More so, I think, than in most of the shows that we've discussed. Yeah. Um, uh, but he goes on with another woman. Uh, uh, um, and again, the perfect line of the uh, uh, of the bigot who doesn't quite understand his own bigotry of like, yes, hair metal at a time where men were men because they weren't afraid to be women. Um, and just... <laughs> the confidence that Cena delivers that line on and just rolls right on. And it's just like, did you hear what you just said? <laughs> the, the confidence of a man in tidy whities dancing around yes. in someone's apartment you've just met and, you know, singing into a vibrator. Time. Yeah. <laughs> and just eyes closed and like into it. Yeah. Um, and then we have the fight, which actually I do want to talk. We don't want to talk about the superhero fights, but this is what I want to talk about because, uh, not only is it an interesting fight, it's like genuinely some interesting choreography, but A, you don't often see a lot of close-up visuals of the fight like this. You usually see them from the back or from a slightly from a distance. There's some pretty good tight shots. So these are the actors who are doing this fight. But also B, uh, 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 the woman in the fight, Annie, um, even though they're both in underwear, it's not presented as sexy. It's presented as a brutal, vicious fight. She is not, you know, she's not like coquettishly curling her back and thrusting her, her breasts out or, you know, you know, falling to the floor. No, she's a feral, vicious beast. And her body language is the same body language you expect from a man uh, in that kind of active action role. Um, and it was so good to see that kind of just brutal fight at this moment. But again, like you know, with this hair metal song playing and in this weird apartment, it's, 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 it's almost surreal what's happening here, but it really helps sell the show. Like this is superhero action. It's for, you expect a fight at this point in time. So we're going to give you a fight, but it's not the fight you expect. Oh, we're going to take a minute to talk about the fight. I want to take, as we do this, let's discuss what superhuman powers peacemaker has. All right. We ready? None. Zero. None. Still not one. She stabbed him. I don't mean like cut. There was a solid yeah. stab yeah. and pull yeah. out. That is enormous. And he's blocking some of the knife blows with his forearms. Yes. Let's, that is a fight that we're having with a, we'll say, we we'll generous, uh, a, a peak human specimen is what Peace America is supposed to be. Yes. Versus someone with supernatural powers and a bladed weapon. And That's, he doesn't do well in this fight. 
No. And again, like it would be so tempting for a lesser writer to go, let's give him a, a moment to come back. Let's give him a moment where it looks cool. No, he just gets his ass kicked. <laughs> So mm-hmm. he has to run away. And, and then, even then, thinking he's safe after a very painful fall, realizes that he's still not safe and has to keep yeah. running. Right. And so he desperately grabs his helmet and turns her into goo with a sonic boom, yeah. which again is a funny moment, but also shows that Peacemaker is not only has objectionable viewpoints, but he's also just kind of not good at his job. Uh, I, I'm torn by that. Well, okay, let me phrase that. Um, if he he's only good at his job when he is prepared for it, right? When he when he can when he has the right equipments and the right plan and whatnot, then yes, he's he's very effective at what he does. But any kind of twist in a plan, he struggles with. So you're almost saying that he is a C grade Batman, D or E, maybe, but yes. <laughs> Because Batman is best when he has his equipment and a plan and everything else set up beforehand. Yeah, absolutely. That's how we get Bat God. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Great then first we- episode. It almost made me want to watch the second episode, even though it's not on our list. Almost. <laughs> almost. Uh, and then we skip over a small scene where um, we find out that uh, Adebayo is working for Amanda Waller, who I think we know in this scene that she- uh, she's her mother. I don't remember if it's this scene or the next episode, but it's it's this one. It's how they end. She says, "Okay, mom," and like right, closes okay. the lap. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, which is is honestly, it's great because also there are, in a way, you start to understand why Adebayo is the way she is because it's like, okay, how can it be the exact opposite of my mother? You know, and, and so like, she, and she is she's very different from Amanda Waller, um, and also it 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 very quickly shows you how awful a manipulator Amanda Waller is. Sick. But then it also gives the contrast again, back to Peacemaker and his dad, that Autobio and Waller, she's picked up a lot of what Waller has installed in her, even though she's trying to be a completely different person. We yes. get that throughout the series from how she's manipulating people, how Waller manipulates people. Yep. And so she has a lot of those skill sets now just ingrained in her even though she may or may not have wanted them right and so what happens is that by the end of this episode we get the 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 core the 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 spine of this season which is that both uh smith and adebayo have been uh abused and manipulated by their parents for their own specific agendas and they're both trying to get out from the shadow of that uh that that childhood and, and that trauma um, and so that's one of the reasons why these characters are connected to each other, even though there's n- no planet would that seem to be a likely pairing, but they do have something in common. Both their parents were horrible to them and treated them awfully for in very different ways. I, w- I am 50% with you. Mm-hmm. We don't know. We, I would agree that Waller was probably psychologically torturous to her daughter. But not to, to the same extent that Peacemaker's oh, father not, was to him. Not to the same extent, um, because the difference between the two is that Adebayo is an adult and has found uh, uh, calm and healthy ways to try to move past her mother, whereas Smith is a child and has not. But Adebayo backslides a bit during the course of this and, and starts to develop, do things that she doesn't want to do um, and struggles with that. Uh, whereas Smith is just starting his journey. So, I mean, I, 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 I'm not saying they're in the same boat, but they're still the same thing. It's like on some level, both of them are being manipulated by their parents and then ultimately move past that manipulation. That is the, the yeah, kind I, of character arc they both share. I just want to make sure that while they are parallel stories, the extent, yes. And I don't want people to confuse that. Like That's, that's fair. That is perfectly fair and a good pushback. Um, just because par- parallel does not always mean just because they're on the same journey does not mean they're starting in the same place or ending in the same place. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have covered a lot of episode one. Is there anything else we need to cover here? Cause we'll kind of skim through the next couple. Ooh, Ooh, no, not at all. <laughs> okay. So, uh, episode four, the child list traveled. The group takes Judah master back to their headquarters. And yes, Judah master is in fact an actual character from DC, uh, where Smith claims he killed the butterfly. And we, 
cut we missed this episode but uh, butterflies are uh aliens that possess people we learn that much at least uh chase aka vigilante drives smith to augie's house to retrieve new equipment where smith learns that augie's been framed and arrested Against Mern's wishes and despite Adebayo trying to talk him down, Smith visits Augie in prison. Augie threatens to expose Project Butterfly to the police. Adebayo suggests to Chase that Smith would be better off without his father, and Chase gets himself arrested so he can kill Augie. Smith and Adebayo return to their headquarters where an escaped Judo Master attacks Smith. Adebayo shoots Judo Master before he can reveal a secret about the butterflies. Smith returns to his trailer where he's keeping a butterfly creature alive in a jar. He reflects on having to kill Rick Flagg, being trained by his father to be violent, and the death of his brother. In prison, Chase provokes Augie's prison mates into fighting, but fails to get Augie involved. He is later bailed out by Harcourt. Adebayo finds a lead in the butterflies and informs Morn, who is secretly a butterfly himself. This is a show that it's hard to pick three episodes out because so much happens throughout the course of it, and, and you do miss large chunks. It's not easy to kind of extract stuff. So I picked this episode primarily for the fight scene in the jail with with vigilante (laughs) um i would say that having only seen these three episodes the episodes you picked it's easy to piece together what happened in the interview if if you're watching carefully it does kind of fill you in quietly on bits and pieces uh because this was a show that came out week to week it was not all dropped at once how tv Um, should be right exactly and that's something that it's interesting We've, we've we've not explicitly gone into this so much but like the stream shows where you get the whole show like umbrella academy i couldn't really do that because it's so much a long movie this was a show it's like you've probably forgotten small details week to week so we have to kind of reencapsulate those again uh so i'm glad that you didn't feel like you're missing too much here um it does try to kind of recap stuff although i think we should have a longer conversation sometime about the concept of a week to week compared to a binge model and those implications i think that'd be a fun talk yeah no i agree uh maybe, maybe we do that for the season recap um uh but uh uh i'm gonna kind of just pick a couple scenes out in rough order here but like uh, the, the, we're chasing smith go back to his house um and, and again smith alf hamley goes oh it's a quantum storage space no 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 i i will not let you skip over okay. the greatness that is the neighbor that is always I was, outside i thought that was after this scene but okay yeah let's talk about that. he watches him unlock the door and like run into the house so yes. you've got that initial thing that we've already got our our nosy neighbor watching so if you if you love sitcoms you have that neighbor that's always there and it's even playing on the history of television like mm-hmm. very nicely done and then yeah. you smith runs in neighbor Fair, fair. Um, I was actually just going to mention the, the 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 quantum thing because um, then they leave, and the neighbor confronts them. And as as I I have very specific details I liked that I want to point out that when sure. Augie walks in, even Augie's unmoved, unfazed by this, and points out that the armor that we still see again, it's like it's it's weak at the joints. Yep, and showing us the type of either tactical or mechanical inclinations that Augie has at the same time. It's just a very chase. Yeah. Chase, thank you. As a, as an offline. So it's like nothing. He's already looks at it. It spots a weakness. Yeah. And, and something that has been steadily unfolding throughout this is that, uh, um, it's not, she never says this, but it's pretty heavily implied that chase is probably neurotypical mm-hmm. uh, on some level. Um, he doesn't, understand social cues very well and that becomes increasingly clear as the show goes on but also he's very much hyper focusing on specific things and this is one of those he hyper focuses on tactical advantage during fights and it's beautifully done yeah um uh, uh we did skip over the toe his pinky toe how can we forget oh. the pinky toe that was the crux of their entire fight argument the whole time i think you're a little mad at me i'm not mad at you uh, that answer sounds a little bad <laughs> You're right. Yeah, we did. We did think about that, and, and it, it shows this relationship these two have, which is so weird because Smith does not like this guy. Chase is firmly convinced that they're best friends, and it's super awkward. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you're right. It, it, it's also the, this this pinky toe thing becomes. It starts off as a joke. It actually was a a, a a little bit in the previous episode, but they were captured and he was tortured and he did have his toe chopped off. Um, it becomes a joke here. It becomes a joke that they double down on a bit later, and then it becomes an actual plot point during a fight. 
So it, it, again, it, like you said, if you keep running a joke into the ground, eventually it becomes funny again. Mm-hmm. And James Gunn does exactly that in his episode. <laughs> Could be why I like James Gunn so much. No. <laughs> but it's, as they leave the house, we do get the neighbor in that confrontation and the talk that you said that we're going to have about Batman and Peacemaker. Right. Um, where it's... Because it, it, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the neighbor is doing kind of what the average audience would do is like, you know, well, Batman doesn't kill people. Why are you killing people? And... Smith correctly, I think, calls out the problem with Batman as a concept. I mean, it, it's not even – he's mad at being compared to Batman. He's unfavorably to Batman. Um, and so he's – on the in an in-world level, he's just angry and venting about, well, the Justice League and all that effectively. But all the things he's saying are correct criticisms for Batman as a concept. And it's amazing because he's delivering it while also putting in this emotional layer of being an angry child. <laughs> and I'm, I'm going to say this, that this is something that I pointed out before this podcast about the very issues with Batman and the Joker constantly killing people. Mm-hmm. And we get back to superior morality. But the neighbor's thing, ending comments, I was just trying to have a conversation. Yes. Oh! Yes. Yes, it is. It is every annoying comic book fan online. <laughs> oh, I almost fell on the floor laughing at that. Yes, because and, and there's so much that happens throughout this whole show of like multiple things are happening every single scene. See, it feels like. And this is one where James Gunn's like, I'm going to call all the Twitter conversations I've had to be part of. <laughs> mm-hmm. Ah. Oh. Um, uh, so, um, there, there, so there's a subplot going on, which again, we kind of touch on, but that's, uh, basically, um, uh, in an earlier point, uh, the, the team almost gets captured by the police. And so, um, uh, Economos hacks in and actually has, uh, Peacemaker's fingerprints swapped for his father. So his father gets arrested for Peacemaker's crime. That's what kind of the crux of how this episode comes about. Um, and so, Augie has been uh, captured by the police and uh, the police detective uh, is an uh, uh, Asian American woman. And he says exactly the things you expect him to say in this circumstance. Um, so we, we missed, we skipped over that, but he also realizes that he needs to cooperate with the police to try to get out of jail. Um, and so we have this dynamic of John, or, uh, Smith is trying to do the right thing to try to actually tell his father what's going on. And his father absolutely is willing to throw that away and get his son arrested to save his own skin. So again, we're continually reinforcing. We don't like his father. His father is a horrible person. Uh, and in the middle of this, Adebayo is, is doing something amazing here because on the one hand, she's like, I can see what the, how painful his relationship with his father is. And on some level, I sympathize and I want to connect with him because I recognize that pain of a complicated parent relationship with my own mother. And so she's presenting herself as just, I feel for this guy. And just in their conversation with vigilantes, I feel for this guy. And I want, I, and I, you know, I, I, it would be so much better if he went away. And then she explicitly later says she did it to try to get him to murder Peacemaker's father, which is such an Amanda Waller move. <laughs> and it goes back to what we learn and is installed with us from our parents. Beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yes. And, it was, wasn't even this. It was instinct that she thought of it, and mm-hmm. even when she puts together who vigilante is, like right there, that you can see all the Wallerisms that she's doing, and how she's trying to fight against some of them and still apply to who she is to the situation. Right, and again, that's a great moment. Like out of bio, is like, oh, you're vigilante. I just just blurts it out, and he starts to backtrack. And she's like, oh, you sound like him, and then she starts to diminish her own accomplishments. Um, like, oh, everyone knows this. Like, like it's that, but like she's the first person to make this connection and she makes it immediately. It's a great way of showing how amazing a character is. But again, it's the, as a woman, we're trained, they're trained to diminish their accomplishments, particularly around men. Um, so a lot's happening in that scene, but also quietly going, Adebayo is amazing at her job, but she refuses to accept that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so um, Smith obviously had an awkward conversation with his father, goes back um, and thinks about – basically recaps his murdering Rick Flagg in uh, the Suicide Squad. Uh, 
Uh, and also we get some impression that he has something to do with the death of his brother, which is not alluded on here. Um, and so he handles that in way any social human, but which is getting high with his alien friend in the jar. Like we all do in these situations. I, I want to talk about chase and white privilege so much right now. Oh, we're getting that. Because... Right now. I, 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 was, I was the next place I'm going. So let's talk about it. <laughs> I saw this scene. Even mm-hmm. with them loitering out in front of the police station, I was already thinking a bunch of white privilege. I, I will go ahead and say now, as a as a black man of a certain age, I do not linger around police stations. I do not linger in the vicinity of police. I will I will remove myself from those as much as possible. Right. Much less to see a character hanging out there and then walking around to where they're all sitting and they watch him do questionable activities. Yes, until literally he commits a crime, and even then. They don't like they sort they get up quickly, but they don't run and dive on him. They draw and basically ask, what are you doing compared to the real world that we live in now? If a black person had done that, they would have been shot and killed. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hands down. They wouldn't have been able to to get the trash can to move the trash can over. It would have been when they were in the area. Everyone would have probably stood up then and looked at them. Right. And the level of white privilege that is and the level of escalation written into this in a comic scene, I will say again, good writing. Yeah. And the fact that he recognizes this is a valid tactic for me to get into the person I'm trying to kill is something that only the white man could have accomplished in this scene. And Otto Bio knows that. It's never mm-hmm. said on the page. No one says that out loud. But all the dynamics point to she is – by the car at the police station. So she's right next to the car by the police station. She never leaves that spot. She talks the man with white privilege into doing that thing. And then he gets put in jail. He walks right up to the table and I love his speech where he's just like, let's, let's go around the table and talk about what things that we love about the contributions of African Americans <laughs> to the United States. And again, it's clearly meant to provoke them, but also he's not wrong in any point of his speech. Historical accuracy will always, always get you bonus points in my book. <laughs> Especially when he's like, yeah, that, I'll say rock and roll. And then when he goes about rock and roll, I'm just like, you're you're 1,000% correct in every point here. <laughs> mm-hmm. And if anyone is ever curious, Elvis owes all of his success to black people. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. So again, it's it's James Gunn going, let's correct let's while I'm here, I'm writing this scene, let's also on that level correct a small misunderstanding that people have about American history. <laughs> Just like, sure, that's amazing. Which is also this is one of the reasons why I am I enjoy but do not love the Back to the Future movie where Martin McFly goes back in time to teach black people how to rock and roll. Um yeah. side yeah. digression. Yeah. I will point out for this scene that I like is that the white dragon goes, I know what you're trying to do. I ain't doing that. (laughs) It just sits down and his whole plan is shot. But we also get the pinky toe moment being fulfilled right now in this fight. Yes. Yes. The, 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 the Chekhov's gun of the pinky toe. (laughs) And it's like, uh, um, and again, uh, to be fair, I mean, uh, I'm going to go back to wrestling here, but that's something else that actually comes up commonly in wrestling matches is if someone uh, has an injury, um, there's often what's called uh, uh, working uh, a limb. So like if, you, if someone has a shoulder, they'll work the shoulder. If someone has an uh, elbow uh, injury, they'll work the elbow. Um, and so the idea is that we continually hit a certain area of the body. So that way from the, the story of the match is that they can't do a key move because that body part fails. And we actually see that pacing here on some level. It's that we keep reinforcing that this toe is a problem and it becomes actually a critical point during the fight. Uh, but because it's a pinky toe, it's funny because it's a, it's not a body part we think of, but it's treated as a very serious – because he's like, you can't walk properly. You can't do anything properly. And, and everyone's like, no, no, it's just a pinky toe. And then sure enough, he can't kick at the critical moment in the fight. He's right. The pinky toe turns out to actually be very vital for whatever reason. I, I don't know. I do not know who this chase actor is before this, but seeing him move around in this show, I kind of want him to be Cyclops. Yes. Oh God. Yes. He would do the uptight badass Scott Summers really, really well. 
Yeah. Ah, uh, uh, so, so his plan fails. Um, uh, and uh, Augie basically says, "My son's trying to kill me." Um, which again, the perfect pacing of the show is like all the mistakes they have made to this point actually help reinforce Augie's, even if it's wrong, it reinforces Augie's case. My son changed these fingerprints. My son tried to get me killed. Therefore, I'm innocent. Uh, And it's a great cascading failure uh, that these these people are are losers and they're just making the situation worse. Even though they're competent, they just keep screwing up and it keeps making the situation worse and worse and worse and worse. Like the Apple Dumpling Gang. Like the Apple Dumpling Gang, which was not a reference I ever expected to hear in a 20, 2019 show, but here we are. Or 2021, 20, actually, show. Yeah. Or in a in a dark show about killing people. Yeah, right? Let's, uh, I, w- I do want to take a beat. I know we're probably running long for this sure. one. But how quickly Augie acclimatized to being in prison. Like it was yes. second nature, like, hey, I'm home. Yes. And already had a small following of people. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, uh, every, uh, I mean, and, and we find out later that he was a supervillain, so it's very likely he did do prison time. But it, end, it ends up – there's a lot of the show that you find some out later that recontextualizes stuff you saw earlier, which I think James Gunn is great at when he, when he has the momentum to do it. And this perfect case is like when in episode one, when Smith came back from prison, he was awkward about being in prison. His dad treated it like – who cares? You're gone for four years. What does that matter? Um, and also, I didn't take care of any of your stuff because I don't care. But then we find out, again, we've never said, but it's very much implied that he spent time in prison before he's used to this environment. So he should know the problems that come trying to come back and reacclimatizing toward the world after coming from prison. And that's how little he cares about his own son. Mm-hmm. So it's like the show explicitly tells you that he's a piece of shit. And then, by the way, also, we're going to implicitly tell you he's a piece of shit in case you missed it. We're going to shove it in your subconscious just to be absolutely sure. I have so never hated a character as much as I hate Augie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then um, he's bailed out by Harcourt. Uh, and uh, um, Adebayo finds out something about the butterfly. She tells Mern. Mern unrolls his proboscis and reveals that he's also a butterfly, which is a big holy crap moment. But some of that is also implied with Mern, where you get a shot of him earlier from how he's sitting on a couch staring at the TV in a very inhuman fashion. Yes. Yeah, there, there, there's, again, one of those things that you... you Again, this whole show is like you see a thing and you go, I didn't expect that. And then like almost immediately afterwards you go, but I should have. Um, and it's – if you can hit that moment, that's that's such a sweet spot to hit because you f- if, if you anticipate the show by like a, a minute or two, you feel really smart. And if you don't, you feel like all the clues were there even if they weren't entirely – fair clues but you still go oh i remember now seeing that and it makes you appreciate the show better because you start to think back on previous episodes fondly because you're trying to put pieces together it's a great way to get engagement with the show especially a show that's dropping week to week like this if this show were streaming i feel like it wouldn't have been nearly as successful because it would have been over so fast but people have a whole week to think about oh remember that thing happened blah, blah, blah. people have a chance to chew on it water cooler talk is so important for tvs and giving them a chance to have momentum absolutely absolutely Okay, anything else in episode four? No, I'm, uh, a couple things, but I can do the next episode. All right. Uh, episode seven, stop dragging my heart around. Uh, feeling betrayed by Adebayo and running out of time, Smith sets out to find the cow with Chase, and the cow is uh, the creature that is feeding all of the butterflies. Um, he goes to find a cow with Chase, Eagly, and a reluctant economist. They are interrupted by Augie and his followers. Harcourt confronts Adebayo on her secret mission and betrayal, learning of her relationship to Waller in the process. Mern attempts to leave with them, but the butterfly possessed police arrive and kill him. Judo Master then attacks Harcourt and Adebayo, who eventually defeat him. Smith is caught by Augie's followers, and the eagle is injured by Augie. Chase hits a weak spot in Augie's armor, disabling his weapons, while Economos kills Augie's followers. Smith confronts Augie about the events that led to Smith accidentally killing his brother Keith while they were children in a fighting pit. And then he kills Augie. 
the team reunites at the veterinary clinic where Eagerly recovers. Without Marn, they appoint Harcourt as their new leader. They prepare to kill the cow before the butterflies can teleport to their enclave. Anabayo tries to apologize to Smith, but he tells her their friendship is over. And in a way, there's not much to say about this episode because with this show, this episode's great at paying off all the threads that we've talked about in the previous episodes in a lot of ways. Are you serious? You don't want to talk about a fighting pit? You didn't have a fighting pit when you were Oh, no, I mean, we, I mean, we, I'm, let's say we'll talk about it, but I mean, we'll, we'll go as, as in depth I, I because I, it's. I just wanted a fighting pit joke. Oh, yeah. I mean, they're Pokemon. It's fine. <laughs> you hit the rock. It's super effective. Uh, no, so, um, uh, the Augie's gang is great in this because once again, James Gunn is relentless about hammering his point home. Like for example, uh, the car they drive, um, I don't know if you noticed it, but the license plate is 14 words, which is a white supremacy, uh, dog whistle. Uh, and a lot of their tattoos are genuine white supremacy symbols. So like Gunn is like, no, you're not getting away from this. This is these people exist. They do act like this. <laughs> this is a superhero fun time. These people are awful, and they're going to get their comeuppance. Well, it's from even the jump. The quote that you used about Pepe is a white supremacist yes. thing, also. Yeah, Pepe the Frog is and, a white supremacy meme. Yeah, mm-hmm. and if anything, you can also say that while he did not directly make a KKK comment or joke, they're literally running around. And fucking white hoods with little points on them. Yep. The mm-hmm. a, almost epitome of white supremacist assholes. Like right there. Yep. Throughout the whole thing. And in the previous episode, in the rant about uh, in, in the jail set, in the jail thing, uh, Chase makes reference to tiki torches too. Uh, um, mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's not even older symbols. It's like, you know, the modern symbols of white supremacy, they're being used and both explicitly presented, but also, again, like little things like license plates of the car. It, it's everywhere. You cannot escape it. You, it's the point where, again, it feels a little uncomfortable and you're supposed to because, like, you, we, you want these people to be punished. And so it's so satisfying when Smith finally deals with his father in this episode. Um. So we uh, so uh, there's again a subplot that we kind of skim over, which is that uh, Waller gave Adebayo a fake diary, uh, which basically pins all of the blames for the uh, Suicide Squad's movie on uh, Peacemaker, uh, that he was a lone gunman effectively, and that he did all that damage himself. Uh, And the team and Smith both find all find out that Adebayo did this. Uh, so that's a lot of the the personal conflict that's happening in, in the, the margins of this episode on some level. Uh, and again, it's hard to pick episodes, but I kind of picked, I mainly picked one, honestly, because uh, it's, it's so satisfying to see audio taken down. But separately, because it's so weird how fast characters have evolved from this. And it, if you watch it episode to episode, it doesn't feel fast. It feels like a natural evolving relationships. But like, they're all friends now. And they genuinely feel betrayed by the thought that one of their own, you know, set them up to take a fall. And even though it's not really them, it's only Peacemaker taking the fall. Everybody else could get away from this as Argus agents, but they're all feel betrayed by this. And also separately, also Morn is also, yes, he's a butterfly, but he's a butterfly that is trying to turn against the other butterflies. So he's... Uh, rebelled against his people. That's a piece, a thread that kind of got glossed over in our episode jumping around. So Morn's part of the rebellion? Yes. <gasps> yes. <laughs> Use the full um, stuck. I, You made a lot of good points. I I had to make my Morn rebellion joke. There's something <laughs> I think I forgot to mention from last episode. And okay. it is the most important thing about this entire series. And spoiler, I, I really enjoyed watching all this <laughs> Peacemaker stuff. And this is what was the the nail in the coffin of my enjoyment is when they broke out the single greatest superhero ever. Better than Superman. Better than Batman. Better than Green Lantern. Matter Eater Lad. Better than Sportsmaster? (laughs) Matter Eater Lad. The greatest (laughs) superhero in the world. Yes. 
and because, it's not even a one-off it's not even a joke it's like it's like a three-minute rant <laughs> and I, I loved it because i grew up when i was younger i read a, a slew of uh, legionnaire comics and matter eater lad was basically their spider-man he was he was a he was a funny member of the team and he didn't show up a lot and he kept getting like pulled away because his power is so utterly useless 99 of the time that the writers couldn't find a way to use it he yep. could eat anything and it is not that he, he and he has to be able to put his mouth on it to chew it to eat it so that it makes it even less useful and it is amazing and apparently peacemaker knows who this person is and has worked with him in the past <sighs> Which then infers that somehow Matty Delad came from the, I think it was a 31st century back to where Peacemaker was, or Peacemaker went to the 31st century. It's it's a total irrelevant thing, but it adds so much depth to the universe, making that establishing Peacemaker is part of the D- larger DC universe, just with that joke in that line. Right. And this goes back to something we said at both Titans and Jupiter's Legacy about um, implying a larger universe. And we felt that both of them failed a little bit because they leaned so hard on the, oh, you know who the Justice League are, so that fills in the gaps. This show, well, spoilers, it does do that, but I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but largely what it's talking about characters that mo- most people have not heard of, and that actually makes this land better because we're talking about a, a relatively minor character very competently and really kind of going into um, – the nuances of that. And you're right. It brings up questions of like peacemakers had a clearly a very long super quote unquote hero career prior to this. And he's just casually referencing it again. You just casually have a, a quantum space closet in your dad's house. <laughs> um, and the fact they just throw these details out as kind of side jokes, but then it's not just a one liner, but like a, there, there's a story each time implies like you've missed like a hundred issues of a comic that never existed. So well done. And I wanted to make sure that I mentioned that before we moved on into the the final beat of what we're going to talk about for Peacemaker. Right. Um, uh, and again, uh, one of the things that's kind of interesting throughout this is that um, we talked about how Waller is just as much a presence as uh, Augie is uh, for uh, Smith in this. But we actually don't see much of her on screen. Um, Waller is spoken of at a remove. And I think as much as I love the actor who plays Waller in all of these shows, I think Waller works better in this regard because Waller is a force of nature. Waller is a, a specter hanging over this team the entire time. And so when you don't, don't see her as often, we don't humanize her. She's just kind of this horrible force that is manipulating everybody. The chess master that's in the shadows, she actually plays really well, I think, that way. That's one of the I think the original... Uh, uh, Suicide Squad comic book, she worked better when she's only on like a page or two, uh, and then you find out the ramifications later. So I think it's a really good way of of using her sparingly but well throughout the show. And Viola Davis did an amazing job as Waller. And mm-hmm. Waller is a character that you, as I agree with you, should only show up for a few panels. She's a character that had Batman stand down and sort of run yes. away with his cape between his legs. Yes. That is how powerful that character is. And mm-hmm. that is why it should be used just a little here, a little there, and have agents that represent her actions everywhere. Right. That's why I was, uh, digression, but I was so pissed when they made her thin in the 52 reboot. Yeah. Um, because it was like, th- that was necessary. She should be a normal person. And this normal person can stand up to these people. That shows how powerful she is. She doesn't need to be sexy. She just needs to be human. Mm-hmm. Uh. Anyway, so um, at this point in time, the Butterflies have possessed a lot of key people, including much of the police force, setting up for the final uh, showdown in Episode 8, which we don't necessarily need to cover because it's going to be a big superhero fight. Um, But this is the kind of prequel big superhero fight uh, where, like you said before, Peacemaker is just a guy. He has no superpowers. And so this is another brutal fight because they're all fighting basically against a super suit. But it's done so well because you're right. All of the bits and pieces were set up throughout all of this. The helmets, like the helmet, they really reinforce the helmets a lot because that's the big point of the tracking bits and all the different kinds of helmets are really the key of this. Like it's a big duffel bag of helmets and how awkward that is, but also the helmet becomes a big part of, of, of 
all this, even though the, the helmet's not the, the landing blow. But then that spare line about, oh, look at all the weak points in the armor from episode four that plays out in this episode. Um, and giving Smith a gun, because again, there was a, we, a, a joke that we glanced over, but like in episode four, it's like he couldn't use a gun unless the Dove of Peace was carved on it, which was a really dumb joke, <laughs> but also apparently a canon accurate detail from the comics, which I never knew about before. But I think that goes back into the psychological trauma aspect of it that they were playing on. Right, right, right. Um, and so it's played for a gag here, but like, I can't use his gun unless the Dove of Peace is on it. Um, and so obviously he gets over that for this moment. Um, so it's... Can we take a beat though to discuss the gun that he killed Augie with? Oh yeah, wasn't the a, a Luger? Yes, it was. Yeah. Which, for people that are curious, the Luger was a, a standard German sidearm. Mm-hmm. In World War II. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of layers happening to this is what I often refer to as the big dumb superhero fight, but it's not dumb. There's this is the rare moment of a superhero fight that actually has a character arc payoff. And that's fantastic if you can pull it off. And I think it happens here because it's not just about taking the white dragon down. It's about Smith finally moving past a childhood trauma. And it helps that they're juxtaposing it with the very literal childhood trauma of like, oh no, you actually did kill your brother because your father forced you into a fighting pit <laughs> with your brother and then blamed you for it. And they're going to sirens. Welcome to London. <laughs> Perfect timing again, though. Right. Um, he should be in jail. Uh, but um, it, it's... We're now... And of course, Eagerly hugs Smith again, which is, again, super important. Well, that's after the fight. We get right, the, right. The, the vet and we get more of Autobio's story about what she did beforehand and hardcore. And we get Judo Master. <laughs> Right, so we skip over a scene where Judah Master is eating chips outside of a store, and they horribly make fun of his size. Two people walk by, they make fun of his size, and he just beats the shit out of them and walks. Judah Master is just the random encounter table of this entire show, <laughs> and it's amazing because I mean there actually is a kind of a weird subplot happening with Judah Master. We kind of conveniently missed all the pieces where that matters, but it really doesn't matter because Judah Master is just kind of a random force throughout this entire arc. And that's fine. He's just a guy that is really good at judo. <laughs> a master of it, if you will. Oh, loved it. And and then we can we can go with the the eagle hug. But I know we're gonna wrap up in a second. I want to talk about how inspiring their speech must have been for the vets that they were potentially gonna kill to arm <laughs> up and say, We're with you, let's go. Yes. Yes. And they're like, no, no, you should, you should not do that. <laughs> but uh, but it, again, not only is it a gag, but it's also the first time someone who's not a member of Argus looks at Smith and goes, that guy was cool. The very first time in the show that happens, the first time the show, someone in the show does not call Peace Banker out. Mm-hmm. And that's intelligent. That's important. That's telling. And the entire crux also of Autobio's change comes about from the miracle of seeing eagerly hug a peacemaker. Yeah. Which, which again, episode one, he said, if you don't believe in miracles, that's on you. And then she does. <laughs> now she believes in miracles because she saw an eagle hug a man. It's, it's, it's a joke. It's a gag. And yet it's got so much heart. Like all of the heart that was missing in Titans is in this show, right? Um, it, it's which which makes watching Titans so frustrating because I knew like shows like this existed, you know. And it's like you can do a gritty reboot and still have heart. Yeah. Uh, so I do want to mention uh, one of the episodes we missed. Uh, a, a extremely minor spoiler for the end of the show, but um, I mentioned that the Justice League doesn't hold the crux of this. Um, they do actually show up at the end of season episode eight, uh, played by the actors who played them in the movies. So Wonder Woman and Aquaman, I believe, show up both uh, at the end, and Peacemaker calls them out. Uh, it's it's a funny little moment. 
it's just like, how in the hell did you pay Jason Momoa to show up and be abused by John Cena for five minutes on screen? But I'm glad you did. (laughs) Because they want to be in James Gunn movies. I think I think it's a big part of it. I think it was which is like, oh, it's James Gunn. Sure, I'll do it. Mm-hmm. And that may uh, have paid off for them now, long term. Also, right, right. Remember uh, when Henry uh, Cavill didn't show up? What's he doing? Yeah, now? yeah, yeah. I heard about that. Uh, so it's, it's something that was supposed to kind of think poke fun at the idea of a DC universe that may end up backdoor and eventually becoming actually uh, a connected continuity. Who knows? But uh, it speaks to, I think, the larger wrap-up I have for this whole show is that Jupiter's Legacy tried to co-opt the the big people of DC Universe to give cachet to a superior universe, and we felt that it failed in that front to try to tell its gritty story. Titans had that cachet to tell a gritty story and squandered it uh, by using relatively big-name characters and just failed to deliver uh, a, sh- a show with heart. This is a show that used bottom of the barrel characters that no one heard of and then throws away big name characters at the end of the show as a joke and manages to accomplish what those previous two shows just couldn't do. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to, when I had the chance to, uh, I would have made a similar point with Doom Patrol, honestly, because Doom Patrol, I think, does the same thing. So I'm glad that we were able to swap in a similar show to, to make the same point. Uh, but I'm glad we got to do Peacemaker for, for another reason, which is that um, it really shows that what Titans tried to do is possible and makes that Titans even more frustrating because it didn't do it. Um, it's not the humor, although certain, the humor certainly helps, not getting me wrong, um, but these are also damaged individuals who are reluctantly drawn into a team to overcome adversity and a huge conflict and end up changing as a result. That's the arc that Titans was clearly trying to go for and just didn't land. And this show managed to stick that so much better with characters like Judo Master. <laughs> uh, only as bad as Sportsmaster. Sportsmaster is still the best supervillain. <laughs> I, will never, I will die on this hill. Uh, anyway, do you have any final thoughts about the show? Uh, just that I'm going to go back and watch it starting with episode two and fill in the episodes I missed and probably watch the whole thing. I'm really I'm glad you glad enjoyed we this. watched it. I, I, I was, I was nervous when you told me uh, behind me speak on a certain, um, I didn't know Chris hadn't watched it until we recorded the last episode. And so afterwards I was like, Oh shit, I should explain. <laughs> These people are assholes. Um, uh, so I was a little nervous initially, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad because I, 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 I'm glad you saw what I saw in this, which is that a show that is both fun, but also was unrelenting in how it's going to approach hard topics in a way that, frankly, we found lacking a lot of the shows we've watched so far. Yeah, it was astonishing. It was astonishing. So I I give kudos to James Gunn and the entire cast and crew that made it happen. Awesome. So this has been some heavy stuff, Chris. Uh, What light, fun show are we going to watch next week? We are going to go back and do the Smallville Justice League episodes that we skipped. And honestly, we, we I get kind Hawkman. Of want to. <laughs> <laughs> Is the Hawkman better uh, than the Hawkman in the Legends? <laughs> yeah, it's Michael Shanks. I liked Michael Shanks oh, as yeah, uh, actually, what, Daniel yeah. Jackson from Stargate. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, actually, that's fair. I mean, no, so what are we actually watching? We're going to watch The Boys. And for the season one, we're going to go episode, season one, episode one, name of the game. Season one, episode four, the female of the species, and round it out with season one, episode seven, the self preservation society. I think mm-hmm. the boys will be a good counterbalance for Peacemaker, and we'll see how that turns out. And, and certainly, uh, we didn't do this last time, but uh, for this one, uh, yeah, if, if you thought the stuff in Peacemaker was heavy, it doesn't get any better in the boys. Um, uh, uh, and not only do you have to deal with a lot of tough topics, but also you have to deal with. Um, a really awful Australian accent that pretends to be an East London accent. So, and be prepared for all, like all the warnings, content all warnings, the isms. because it is graphic. It is ism filled. It has assault. It has everything. Right. So if it it's is, not it, your bag, 
please feel free to skip it. And the following week will be something not as intense. No, this is this is the 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 grittiest on the gritty scale. I think that we're going to cover. Um, so uh, we will see you all next week as we hey, dive into. Hey, huh? you, you forgot. What I forget? Self promotion corner. Oh, Eddie. right, right, right. Eddie, do you work on books? If I wanted no. to buy a, an Eddie Webb book or a company that Eddie Webb worked for, where would I go? What would I buy? Uh, if you want to buy my stuff, you can go to pugsteady.com. From there, you can find access to all the stuff I've worked on, including my creator-owned content, such as Realms of Pugmire, which you can also find at realmsofpugmire.com. If you like to hear the kind of nonsense I spout outside of this co- podcast, and why God would you, you can find <laughs> me on social media, also as Pugsteady, both on Twitter and dice.camp. And you can also find me on the Darker Hue Discord where I am spouting nonsense like the people at eBay who never actually got me my poly bags, but at least they refunded my money, so I guess it's okay. <laughs> How about you, Chris? Uh, if you're looking for me, you can find me at darkerstudios.com. You can buy some of my stuff there. You can buy it at IPR. If you really want to, you can go to our Telesaur and Games, who I think still have two copies of Haunted West that, that they'd probably like to get off their shelf. Yeah. You can find me on social media at Dice Camp at DHS or on Twitter still at Dark underscore Hue. I would suggest coming to the Discord where four of us are still occasionally chatting about something. Yes, but we always have good conversations. Uh, so now with that, definitely next week, we'll talk about the boys. See you, you then. See you.